The Bible says, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This is what the Bible says, that when Christ returns with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these he shall punish with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Christ is going to return and is going to judge your life and no amount of riches, no amount of money, no amount of nice clothing and big houses and nice cars will be able to pay him off. And there'll be no slick lawyer to get you off on that day either. And God is going to judge you in righteousness. The Bible says that God commands all men everywhere to repent because it's coming a day in which God will judge the world in righteousness. And if you're living in sin, friends, you are not ready. The Bible says, do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Did you hear that? The Bible says drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you're a drunkard, you need to become a former drunkard. You need to seek the Lord while he may be found. You need to call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked, that's you if you're a drunkard, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Yes, the Bible says a sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. That the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of God. Fornicators. The Bible says, for this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor a covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. If you're here today at Kentucky Derby, you're being a partaker at the least of those who are in covetousness and idolatry and fornication and all manner of uncleanness. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 10, And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. And that's what many women who are here today are like. They come here in the attire of a harlot. Their heart is crafty. They are loud and rebellious, and their feet will not stay at home. And the Bible condemns such people. Satan. Yes, you worship Satan. I agree, sinner. You worship Satan, and you'll go to the same hellfire he's going to go to if you don't repent. But there's no party in hell, sinners. You'll be cheering on that day. You'll be giving a thumbs up in hell because you'll be in too much torment to do anything nice or good. No parties in hell, no, tr no getting drunk in hell, no fornicating in hell, no having sex outside of marriage in hell, no betting on horse races in hell, no getting dressed up in the attire of a harlot and having men lust after you in hell, just pain and torment. The rich man cried out in torment and asked for just a drop just a drop of water on his tongue, just a little bit of relief, and it was not granted to him. No relief 
was granted to him. And that's what God will say to you if you ask for relief from the flames of Hades or the flames of hell. You'll be granted not one inch, not one bit of relief. Let me read Proverbs 7, 10 and 11 again. Let's see how many ladies will listen, how many women will listen. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. You're proving my point. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. If you come here today, women, with the attire of a harlot, with a crafty heart, and you're loud and rebellious, and your feet will not stay at home, the Bible does not paint you in a good picture. The Bible calls you an adulterous woman. And the Bible says that adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they did not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Yeah, so Christ didn't come into the world to condemn sinners, but the world through him might be saved. That might is where you come in. That might is where you must repent. That might is where you must give up your sin and trust in Christ. And don't get this idea that you, you believed in your, heart, in your mind you believed in your head and have this intellectual assent, this mental belief that you're okay with God and continue to sin. That's not true. The Bible says, you believe in one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Many people claim to have saving faith. They claim to have trusted in Jesus Christ, but they continue in their sins day in and day out. But 1 John 2, 3 through 4 says this, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. You know, if you're just like the world, you're just like the people around you, the Bible says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The Bible says if you love the world, you're an enemy of God. So adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Yeah, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you're a friend of the world, you live your life like the world, you love to sin like the world, then you are an enemy of God. And you're on the wrong side. You're on the wrong side. Because you're going to lose in the end. You've got to read the end of the story. You've got to read the end. And in the last chapter, Revelation 22... Verses 14 and 15, it says this. Blessed are those who do the commandments of God, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are the dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Yes, that's who is outside the kingdom. Maybe you're on that list today. Maybe you are sexually immoral. Maybe you are an idolater. Maybe you love or practice a lie. If so, you're going to be... You tell the truth about yourself? About yourself? Where are you going right now, young man? Where are you on your way to? On hell or heaven? Are you going to hell or the kingdom of heaven? Well, you've got to tell the truth about yourself. Are you a liar? Have you lied before? 
Okay, well then you're loving and practicing a lie, and right now you're outside the kingdom. No, no, there's no good reason to lie. Liars will go to the lake of fire. You need to repent, young man, before you end up in hell. Yeah, so every liar shall have his part in the lake of fire. No, we don't want you to go there. We want you to repent of your lying and all of your sinning and trust in Christ and follow him. The Bible says this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. God wants you to be saved, but if you're a sinner right now, you're not saved. You're on your way to hell and need to repent. That's what the Bible says about you. You need to repent. God wants all to be saved, every single one of you, all of humanity, because you're made in God's image, have value in his sight. He wants all of you to be saved. But there's only one God, only one God, not multiple gods like Hinduism teaches. Allah is not a God, he's a demon. Only one God, the God of the Bible. And he's only sent one mediator between him and us. His name is Jesus Christ. And see, there's a problem between sinners and God. The problem between sinners and God is a sinner's sin. The sinner loves his sin, he's a rebel in God's universe. And God is angry with the wicked every day. Jesus hates lawlessness and loves righteousness. And so there's a problem between you and God. Your problem is you're a rebel in God's universe, and he is the king of kings and lord of lords, and he expects you to live a certain way, and you haven't done it. And so you're a criminal, and God is going to cast you into his eternal jail cell called hell. But he sent a mediator. He sent a go-between between you and him that can forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of your sins and pardon you of your sins. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the only mediator between God and men. He's the only one sufficient to solve the problem between you and God. And the problem, once again, is your sin. And if you forsake your sin and trust in Christ, who is the mediator, he can make things right between you and God. He can make things right between you and God. Because if you're a sinner, your sins have separated you from God so that he will not even hear your prayers or pay attention to your prayers. So what you need to do is draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter turn to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. Humble yourself in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. But you must humble yourself. You stay in your pride. I know you're all dressed up real nice today, and got your nice hat on, your colorful clothes. But you need to humble yourself. You need to realize in the midst of your, your dress and all the clothing you have on, that in God's eyes, if you're a sinner, you're just as filthy in his eyes as a pig in the mire, as a pig rolling around and wallowing in the mud. That if you're still a sinner, that God sees you no better than a filthy, dirty tampon. That's the way God sees you. And your good works will not help you. You need to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. His, his blood was shed on the cross to forgive you of your sins. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And that blood that was shed is Jesus Christ. No other person shed their blood for you. No other person offers you eternal life through his sacrifice, but Jesus Christ. He is the foundation for forgiveness and reconciliation is Jesus Christ. But the Bible makes it clear, if you are unrighteous, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. People who are dressed immodestly with your, the attire of a harlot, the Bible makes it clear you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Many of you women who come here today, the way you're dressed, a harlot would not have dressed that way 20 years ago, 50 years ago. They would have been embarrassed to walk around. You ever seen those old Western movies with the, with the brothels 
even the women back then dressed more modestly than most of the women who are here today. But if you come dressed in the attire of a harlot, you're in trouble. You're causing men to lust after you. You're causing men to sin. You're causing men to look at you and gawk at you and desire you and covet you. When the Bible says you should not covet your neighbor's wife. So the Bible says so you should not cover, you covet your neighbor's wife, but if you're causing your neighbor to covet you, you're in trouble. You need to go home, put more clothing on, put looser clothing on, and follow Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ would never lead you to dress the way you are dressed for most of the people here today. Never. But then again, for, for you guys who are going into Churchill Downs today to bet on races and to covet and to get drunk, Christ wouldn't lead you here at all. Because drunkards will not inherit the kingdom of God. And those who are covetous, those who are betting on races, God would not lead you to do that either. The Bible says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put the death, the deeds of the body, you will live. You need to forsake your sins. You need to trust in Jesus Christ. You need to follow Him and obey Him. Many of you are searching for purpose in life. But the purpose you have, what is your all, is to fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. In Proverbs chapter 1, starting in verse 20, it says, Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in chief concourses. At the openings of the city, opening of the gates in the city, she speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. When your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind. When distress and anguish come upon you. They will then call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despise my every rebuke. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple will slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. Because you will not heed God's counsel, people of Churchill Downs, because you will not obey God, you refuse the fear of the Lord. The Bible says he will laugh at you at, in your calamity. He will mock when your terror comes. You need to fear the Lord. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And if you're out here today to bet on horse races, to be covetous and greedy, if you're out here today dressed immodestly, if you're out here today to get drunk, if you're out here today to think about fornication, you're in great danger. You need to repent. Judgment day is coming. The Bible says your life is a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Your life will vanish away eventually. It could vanish away today. And if it does and you're still in your sins, all that's left for you is the holy wrath of God. God commands you to fear Him. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 6, 
and mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. I wonder how many here today, with their mouth, with their lips, will speak forth blasphemies from their mouth. The Bible says, out of the mouth comes the overflow of the heart. And of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you have filthy words proceeding from your mouth, it shows everyone around you who hears your words. You have a filthy, sinful heart. You need a new heart. You need to forsake your sins. You need to follow Jesus Christ who shed his blood for you on the cross. He said, repent or perish. He said, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And many of you don't heed the counsel of God. You scorn. Scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate my knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you, and I'll make my words known to you. Because I have called, and you refuse. I have stretched out my hand, and no one regarded. Because you have disdained all my counsel, and have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. America's been on this path for a long time of sin and unrighteousness where homosexuality and rampant sexual depravity abounds, where abortion is committed every day and God hates the shedding of innocent blood. America's been going on this path for quite some time where sin is uplifted, good is called evil, and evil is called good. People love sin and hate righteousness. When Jesus is the exact opposite, he loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. And when you're opposite of Jesus, it shows you're on the wrong team, that you're an enemy of God. The Bible says, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. The lust of the flesh, oh, I, that feels good, I want that, that makes me feel good. Sexual morality, covetousness, greed, oh, I, I put all this money down the bed, what a, what a high I get from that. That, the lust of the flesh. And whoever is indulging in the lust of the flesh, they're not of the Father, but are of this world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. The lust of the eyes. Oh, look at her. Look at her. Look at her backside. Look at her front side. I'm lusting after her. The lust of the eyes. It's not of the Father, but as of this world. As you men gawk and lust after all these immodestly dressed women, as the women gawk and lust after your money and your riches, the Bible says the lust of the eyes is not of the Father, but as of this world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. The pride of life. Oh, look at me. Look at my fancy car. Look at my fancy suit, my fancy dress. Oh, look at my big house. Look, I'm going to Churchill Downs. Look, I won. Look at me. The pride of life. The Bible says the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God will abide forever. Yeah, so you're, if you're indulging in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, you are not of the Father of this world. You need to repent. You need to forsake your sins. You need to go and sin no more. You need Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's the words of Jesus. Your Roman Catholic traditions will not help you. The Pope cannot help you. Mother Mary cannot help you. The so-called saints who you pray to or you ask to pray to God for you, they cannot help you. But Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, 
who came to take away the sin of the world, now he can help you. The Bible said at just the right time and without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and though we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. But he didn't die for you, so you would stay a sinner. Christ died for the ungodly to make them godly. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.15, And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And Jesus died for all, that those who live, that's you, should live no longer for themselves, that's you, but for him, Jesus, who died for them and rose again. Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says that he gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age to the glory of God our Father. Christ gave himself to deliver you. 1 John 3, the Bible says that Christ was manifested in the flesh to destroy the works of the devil in your life. See, Christ didn't die just to forgive you just so you can keep on coming back for him for perpetual unforgiveness. Christ died for you to make you holy. Christ died for you that you might obey him. The Bible says, as obedient children, not conforming yourself to your former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who calls you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call upon the Father, who without partiality will judge each man according to his deeds, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. For you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. Christ shed his blood for you as a lamb without spot and without blemish so that you would conduct yourselves at the time of your stay here in fear. So that your sins become former. The lust you used to engage in become former lust. That you'd be obedient children. That you'd be holy as he is holy. That's why Christ shed his blood for you. But so many profess to be Christians in this wicked and dark age. Like all these immodestly dressed women walking here today. I guess probably 30% of them would say they're Christians that are living for God. But the Bible says if you love God, you will keep his commandments. And one of his commandments is not go to Churchill Downs and bet on a horse who can make lots of money and become rich. That's not one of Christ's commandments. That's not one of Christ's commandments. Hay is for horses, is that what you said? That's real original. Yes, but horses are not made for sin. They're a creature of God that God put on this earth not for you to sin over, not for you to be idolatrous over with all the horse statues all around Louisville. Not so you can bet on them and, and place all your hope in a horse, but to put your hope in God. Creation is meant to testify of God's handiwork. Creation is not there for you to be idolatrous over. Romans 1 prophesies about people like you. These people who worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is forever blessed. Amen. The Bible says these people worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is forever blessed. Amen. That's you. That's called idolatry. The only one who deserves your worship is Jesus Christ. Animals don't deserve your worship. Jockeys don't deserve your worship. Money does not deserve your worship. 
The Bible says, do not lay up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But rather lay up for yourself treasure on heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your treasure, friends? Where is your heart? Is your heart on earth? Is your heart at Churchill Downs? Is your heart on some kind of horse in there, betting all your money on it? Is your heart on sexual morality and drunkenness? Then your heart is on earth. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Bible says you cannot have two masters. For either you will love the one and hate the other, or else you'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and riches. You cannot serve both God and sexual immorality. You cannot serve both God and your own body as you desire worship from men who lust after you. Many of you women who dress immodestly, your problem is that you want men to worship you. You want to be a little goddess. You may even call yourself that. You want to be a little goddess. But only God uh, should enjoy such adoration and affection from human beings. You shouldn't want someone to worship you and want to sin after you. But the Bible says that those who are engaging in sin are just like their father, the devil. So it shouldn't amaze us when a sinner wants to be worshipped. That's exactly what Satan did. While he was still up in heaven, he desired in his heart to ascend the holy hill of God and to dethrone God. He wanted to descend the heights and he wanted to be God. But he's not qualified, either are you. You're not qualified to be God. You're not qualified for worship. You're not qualified for adoration. Only Jesus Christ is qualified for such things. You need to forsake your sins. Show me the devil horn, bro. No, sinner, I'm not going to show you devil horns. Come on, what? I'm a, I'm a Christian. You're a sinner. Why would I align myself with you? You're drinking a beer. You're smoking. What do you hear? I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner by your definition. No, by the Bible's definition, you're a sinner. By a 2,000-year-old book. Actually, not even that old. What's your point? So because of the 2,000-year-old book, it isn't qualified to be truth? It stood the test of time. No, not really. No. It has a stead to test. So, so what's the cutoff point? 1,000 years, 1,500 years? When is it cut off that a book's trustworthy? Answer the question. What's the cutoff point for years for a book to be trustworthy? That's my point. That's what you're doing. You're saying, oh, it's 2,000 years old. It can't be trusted. What about the nonsense? You know what the real truth is? You don't want it to be true because it condemns you and tells you to live a certain way. And you don't want to obey God, sinner. So what? That's probably part of the problem. You're raised Roman Catholic. It doesn't matter what your grandma says, it matters what the Bible says and God's word says. So, so, so are you wearing a polygame garment? You, you, you sinners bring up all the same objections no matter where I go, whether it's Canada or Kentucky or Florida. You have the same silly objections. Me wearing polyester and cotton is not condemnable. I'm not a Jew. I'm not living under a Jewish theocracy or a Jewish monarchy. I'm a Christian, a Gentile, new covenant Christian. And my wearing of clothing that has cotton and polyester is not going to justify you for your drunkenness and justify you for your smoking and your filthy mouth and your covetousness. Yes. You're not drinking wine and you're doing to get drunk and you know you are. Exactly. Listen, you're a filthy mouth. You reveal the state of your heart by your filthy mouth. It's, yeah, and words are important. And the Bible says you'll give an account for every idle word. Just like that F word that came out of your mouth a minute ago. It's an idle word to you, but to God it matters. That's why I'm here, sinner. I'm here to walk with you common people. I'm here to call you to repentance, sinner. I'm here to call you to give up your drunkenness and your smoking and your Roman Catholicism. Well, I don't have to, but God's going to be a lot worse than mine. God's judgment will be worse than mine. God's judgment will be worse than mine, sir. You're not ready. You're not ready. You act, you act like you take comfort in God judging you. There's no comfort in God judging you. You're gonna you're in great danger. God's judgment is worse than mine. There's no comfort in saying only God can judge me. 
Where's your comfort in that? God sees your thoughts. He knows every idle word. He knows every deed done in darkness, and nothing escapes him. Hebrews 4.13 says, For there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked, uncovered. All things are open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Good luck with your sinning. You're going to end up in hell in the end. I don't believe in luck. I believe in Jesus Christ. Luck does not exist. No leprechauns, no four-leaf clovers that'll help you or rabbit's foots or crossing your fingers or not walk under ladders or not walking past a black cat on a certain day or not partying on Friday the 13th or going like this with your Roman Catholic crosses, like that's going to help you. All superstitious nonsense does not help you one bit. But as Hebrews 4.13 says, there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and uncovered. All things are open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Where's your comfort in that, sinners? Where's your comfort in that, drunkards? Where's your comfort in that, porn watchers and immodestly dressed people? Where's your comfort in the fact that there is no creature hidden from his sight, but that all things are uncovered, all things are open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. There's no comfort for the sinner in such things. It's only comfort for the saint. Only comfort for the innocent. Only comfort for the forgiven. Only comfort for those who are not guilty. But if you're a guilty criminal in God's universe, you should take no comfort in the fact that God is going to judge your life and he knows everything. Every thought that's gone through your brain, everything you do in darkness, late at night in your bedroom that no one else knows about, the things you sneak around about. Maybe you're cheating on your spouse secretly, quote unquote. Well, she may not know about it, and your friends and family may not know about it, but God knows about it. Maybe you're looking at pornography late at night, and your wife or your husband don't know about it, and you think you're getting away with it. You think you're okay because of that. But the fact is, you're not okay. The fact is, you're still going to get an account of it on Judgment Day. That's why you need to repent. That's why you need to give up your sin. Matthew 7, 13 to 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. You need to get on the narrow, the difficult path. You need to enter through the narrow gate. What we have here at Churchill Downs, the picture of the broad gate, the wide gate and the broad path. A picture of that. The wide gate and the broad path. And here we have today, the difficult path is crossing over, has an intersection with the broad path. And as people on the narrow path, the difficult path, we're calling you from the broad path and we're calling you to the difficult path, to walk through the narrow gate of Jesus Christ and get on the difficult path which leads to life. Yes, the, if you think, even though the difficult path is difficult and it's narrow, nothing so bad as the way of the sinner. The way of the sinner is hard. I used to be a sinner. I know it. It's misery. It's misery. Drunkenness and fornication, puking your guts out, having guilt and shame every day for all the sin you're committing, which is a function of God's conscience given to you. And the conscience either accuses when you do wrong or excuses when you do right. But your misery day in and day out from your sin. Some of you may say, well, I don't feel miserable, probably because you've seared your conscience, corrupted your conscience, defiled your conscience. But we're calling you today with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. We're trying to pierce through that rough outer exterior to the tender parts of your conscience again and call you to repentance and call you to the kingdom of God and call you to give up your sins, which will lead to your destruction and walk in holiness instead. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. 
but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're here today to offer you eternal life through Jesus Christ. There are some requirements, some conditions to getting eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that's denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Him. That's forsaking your sin and trusting in Christ and obeying Him the rest of your days. Stop dressing immodestly. Stop betting on horses. Stop being covetous. Stop being drunkards. And follow Jesus Christ instead.